I'm sure you, like me, love opening the weekend paper looking for that satire, political satire of Zapiro or some other cartoonist commenting in a joking way of the politics of the week or the social fiber of its day. I also loved that great book by George Orwell in 1946, um, Animal Farm it was called, just after the end of the Second World War, we commented in a satirical way of the socialist government in Russia and the fiber calling for a, a reform in its people. In the same way, I didn't know that, but Gulliver's Travel in the mid of the 18th century was not a kid's story originally, but was a political satire of British politics in its day, calling for the reform of both the political system and the fiber, social fiber of the day. Political history, political satire, dates back 2,400 years to Aristophanes, that great father of comics, the Greek philosopher who wrote satirical stories to call the politics of his day to reform as well in Athens, and also calling the, the people in the day to change their ideology, to change the way they look at power in a people. You know, in the same way, apocalyptic genre calls for political reform. It calls for the change in government and the change in the people in the nation, especially God's people, to change their ideology, the way they believe the world should be, and the way God's power should be manifest. And this is what chapter 13 is all about. In the first verse of chapter 13, we see that John stood on the sand. He says this, I stood on the sand next to the sea. And the reason why he says this, because we know that in this chapter, a great beast will come out of the sea and a great beast will come out of the land. And in chapter, chapter 11, just two chapters ago, he saw at the beginning of this section, Christ standing firmly with his one foot in the ocean and one foot on the land. And he said, by implication, that I'm sovereign over everything in creation, both what comes out of the land and what comes out of the sea. And here, in this apocalyptic way, in this unveiling of what happens behind the scenes, what's actually at play in the world today, we see that a great beast and a great uh, beast will come out of the sea and of the ocean and of the land and they will wage war on God's people and dom have dominion on the land until Christ comes again. Chapter 13 verse 1 And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and on his head there were ten crowns and he had a blasphemous name. We see that he's likened to the great dragon and we'll see why because the great dragon is his source. Great dragon chapter 13 Satan himself now a beast which I saw was like a leopard his feet were like that of a bear and his mouth like that of a lion and the dragon gave him power from from his throne and for authority and it's amazing that here John alludes again to Daniel that great prophecy in chapter 7 where he was speaking about the political forces that are going to play out in the next few years in the next century and he was referring to four great beasts is referring to the lion and the leopard and the bear and then a great dragon, some great beast which has not been seen before. And it refers to the political empires of Babylon, the Persians and of Greece, Alexander the Great in particular and after him the four, the four kings that took over from him and then of the Roman Empire. And everyone, every first century Christian who read this literature, in fact every first century person would know that he's referring to Daniel's literature because apocalyptic genre was extremely popular in the first century and was know, would know that he was speaking about the politic system of the day and he says that these beasts were four in one it was not just the one it was four in one so in general he's not just referring to the Roman Empire but he's referring in general to political power to state power to governmental power as a principle in the world that's what this beast represents. I saw that one of his heads had a mortal wound, but it healed. And all the world marveled and followed behind this political system, this beast. Verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon and gave him authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who on earth is able to make war against this great Raymond system, against this great beast? And he was given a mouth to speak blasphemous things. And he had authority on earth for 42 months. Now, I'm not going to unpack 42 months again. You're welcome to look at the previous two sessions to read the notes below. But it refers, in principle, to the redemptive period that Christ 
has, since Christ has left the earth, ascended to heaven until he returns again. This great period is referred to as a, re, as a redemptive period of 42 months, wherein Christ gives grace for the people to recognize his right authority until he comes back to judge. So this beast has authority. He opened his mouth, he spoke blasphemies against God, against his tabernacle and all who dwell in them. And he was granted, verse 7, to, take, to make war against the saints, to overcome them. And he had authority over every tribe, tongue, people and nation. And it's amazing that this beast is given great authority. We see that this beast has authority also over God's people. And we note it because this beast made war in chapter 13, or in chapter 12 already, on the two witnesses and he killed them. So we know that this beast operates in vengeance from the dragon side against God's church as well. But then we see another beast coming out. Another beast. We see that there's another beast um, rising up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. And this is such a powerful allusion to Christ in chapter 5. Such a powerful allusion. Because Christ is one who sounds like the lion of Judah. But when he turned around, John saw a lamb who had been slain. So we see a very similarity and later on as we unpack this vision in the next chapters we'll see that there's a great false trinitary a false trinitarian replica where god the father god the son and god the holy spirit we see here that there's this beast and the, this beast is later called the false prophet and then there's a great harlot um babylon and we see that they they mirror the working of god because we'll see now that this beast and you can read it at a later stage that this beast that came out of the earth has one great focus, and that is to make the nations follow him who sits on the th throne, to make the nations worship him, to bring them in, in seductive power through deception and through the signs to bring him into that. And we see that he has the same role in this deceptive, diabolical trinity as Christ has in the trinity, to bring the nations under the reign of Christ and to make them worship Christ himself. But then I want, to, want you to see what is the second beast. The first beast, political power, like we see in Genghis Khan, like we see in Pharaoh, like we see in Domitian, like we see in Hitler. You know, great oppressive worldly systems that exist to empower themselves at the cost of others. The story that, um, that Animal Farm wrote about. So here we see that the second beast that comes out of the earth is deceptive in nature and wields power. It is ideology. He refers to seductive ideology. He refers to that ideology, the belief system that empowers the government. You know, in the government of the day, we can see in the seven letters that Domitian was in power and worshipped by everyone because the belief system in the day made him powerful, made people believe that it's his right to be worshipped. So all the pagan festivals, all the worship, all the the immorality of, of coming back, dating back to Baal worship and Roman worship in its day, made people believe that it's right for you to be there. We even see that they refer to the synagogue of Satan a few times. So even Jew, the Jews had, had compromised in some way to say that it's right and fitting for them to give to pay homage to Caesar in this way. And therefore the belief system of the people in the day said, yes, of course you may oppress us because you are the Son of God, and it's right for you to be worshipped this way. We see it in our day as well. We see that the ideology of Marxism empowers communist governments around the world. We see that the ideology of Hinduisms empower a case system in the East, where some people are more equal than others. Some people are more human and more godly, and others are more like animals. And it fits, it fits the political system of the day. It empowers the political system of the day. Secular humanism empowers the liberality and the tolerance theory, which is destroying Europe at the moment. We see that, um, that, that Islam, the ideology of Islam, the ideologies in Islam, empower Afghan tribal leaders or oppressive uh, leaders in Iran and Pakistan, North Korea, all over the world, because the belief system makes people believe that it's fitting and right to be oppressed and abused in this way. It is right like that. African animism empowers dictators throughout the continent because their tribal belief system says that it is right for someone to be like this and for me to be poor. It, it's fitting like that. So the second beast represents ideologies. The first, first beast out of the sea represents the political power. And the role of the ideology is to 
bring everyone under the power, under the sway of the beast. Then we see here that verse 15 onwards, verse 16, that this beast causes all rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand uh, and on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of, and the name of the beast and his number. And the number then is calculated here says the number of man is 666. Now this number and this mark of the beast is one of the greatest causes for conspiracy theories and fear all around the world. Especially in turbulent times like this where there are changes. People always are suspicious at who is causing these changes. And is this the time that we'll get the microchip and may not buy anything because the mark of the beast will force me to have something or is this not? So let's look at what this mark may be and may not be. To make sense of the mark of the beast and the number 666, we simply apply the guiding principles for apocalyptic genre like we did up until now. First of all, we look at historicity. Secondly, we'll look at the Old Testament for allusions. And thirdly, we'll look at numerology, just the, the, the study of the symbolism, the numbers in apocalyptic genre. So first of all, uh, historicity, you know, we've mentioned this in quite a few of the studies that we did of the churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3. And we noted that imperial worship was at the order of the day. And the reason why John was in prison and why the church was persecuted is because they refused to worship the emperor. It refers to worship the beast, the political system of the day, using the language of chapter 13. And the refusal caused them that they could not trade in the marketplace unless they compromised in some way, which we saw in some of the churches they did. And the issue is, if you went into the marketplace, you may not trade until you have paid homage to Caesar, or to, to Domitian, saying that Domitian is Lord, he is the Son of God, and then by offering either meat or by offering some incense, you get a mark of that on your arm. The same way that the Jews in the Old Testament got spattered with the blood of the lamb that they sacrificed. Just to, to say that you, you have paid homage, you are one who have paid homage to Caesar and you're welcome to freely trade in his domain. And that's the first reference there of the mark on the beast, trading, not trading, buying and selling. The second thing, if we look into the Old Testament, where have we seen the mark on the hand and a mark on the head? And you're right, it is in the great prayer that every single Jewish believer prays every single day. Hear Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear Israel, the Lord your God is one. The Lord is one, there's only one God. You shall love the Lord your God, verse 5, with all your heart, soul, and your strength. In verse 8, it says that this law shall be on your hand and on your forehead as a constant reminder that your actions and your attention shall be directed to him, that you shall be loyal to God every single day. And this is what this reference means here. It means that, that these people who had the mark of the beast and not the mark of Yahweh on their head and on their hand are people devoted to the beast. All their actions, their ideology, and their, all their actions, their worship and their actions, obedience, and their ideology, their thinking was directed in obedience to the beast. They were enslaved and obedient to the beast. And the number 666 in, in apocalyptic genre, 6 is short of 7, short of perfection. 6 is the sign of man. It says here, it is the number of man. It says here literally, it's not so difficult. And it, it literally means sinful, man in his sinful state, man in his imperfection, man created on the sixth day, short of perfection. And that's what it means. So if you put the three together, like we, when we sing the phrase, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, it speaks of the fullness of worship to God. Here it speaks about the fullness of imperfection. Like one commentator, William Hendrickson, that I like to quote in Revelation, he, he said that the number 666 demonstrates failure upon failure upon failure. The best of human, the best of the culmination of human effort is flawed, unable to bring peaceful, lasting reign. Man's government is insufficient, will not last, and will not solve all the problems. It's insufficient. And this is what it means. So if we bring all this together, what is it saying? What Christ is saying to the first readers, the first recipients, those churches suffering under this reign of Emperor Domitian, he's saying to them that you who take the mark of the beast, you compromise. Know this, that for all of you, that you will forever suffer in the insufficiency of this 
of this beast. That this political system will never ever give you lasting peace. And this political system uh, will be judged by me. And this political system will always hunt you down. Will always be oppressive in its nature. And he's saying that to every single person who trusts in human government. That they cannot last. So therefore, in chapter 14, he opens up with a beautiful image of the Lamb and his army of 144,000 people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation who bears the mark of God on their forehead. And they will be liberated after they have suffered in this age. What do I do with this? First of all, I remind myself, and you need to remind yourself, that one out of every eight people in the world, Christians in the world, suffer persecution violently from the political system of their day and the ideology that keeps that political system in power, whether it's socialism, whether it's Islam, whether it's Hinduism in its militant form, or whether it's African animism in its tribal form. They, they're suffering severely. So the reality of the oppression of the beast is real. But the reality of the persecution of the beast is also real in nations that have churches like Laodicea, where, where there seems to be relative prosperity and there's peace, and the church becomes apathetic and it's also the beast winning. It's also the beast waging war with the church to not trust in the peace that the government or the culture of the day can give you, the ideology of the culture can give you. Because that's also a lie. It's also not lasting. And it moves you away from Christ. It moves you to be loyal to the beast and not to Christ. To take the mark of the beast, trust in the beast, and not trust in Christ. And that's a call for me. So how do we wage war? This chapter reveals a few ways. First of all, read the word. To study the word so that we may know what God is like and what his government is like. And also so that we can be able to recognize the beast. That we're able to recognize what in our city, like Paul walking through Athens, what in my city disturbs me deeply. What in the government of my day or the ideology of my day disturbs me deeply. And it's necessary to get that prophetic edge to, do, to discern our times. Thirdly, it's also just to render to Caesar what is Caesar and to render to God what is God. What do we render to our Caesar, to our government of the day? Well, we render the, the tax that is appropriate. We render the praise and the, and the respect and obedience to the laws that are good and right and fitting in our nation. But it also means that I render to Christ myself and my worship and my complete allegiance to Him, which sometimes might result in conflict and might result in in great conflict and a persecution by the culture and the power of my ideology and the political system of my day because I do not compromise with my system. Lastly, I live to reveal the gospel. The work of the church is to witness the reign of Christ in this fallible, imperfect human system, regardless of whether it's peaceful or not peaceful at the moment. May this help you. May this encourage you. God bless you. Thank you.